want to read here in Isaiah chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. When you have it, say amen. It reads like this. It says, there shall come forth a rod from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his root. There shall come forth a rod from the stump of Jesse, and a branch will grow out of its root. This morning, I want to speak to you on a message that I feel the Lord has given me for this season entitled Season Shift. Season Shift. Can you just say that with me? Say Season Shift. And I want to talk to you about hope for a new season. Before you're seated, shake your neighbor's hand and tell them, Merry Christmas. Go ahead and be seated today. I'll tell you, man, when you're at the end of a year, it's always exciting to know that a new year is on the horizon. And I don't know about you, but when I come to the end of a thing, I'm always ready for God to bring a season shift within my life. In, in this portion of scripture we read, Isaiah the prophet delivers a promising prophecy to a people who have been through some stuff, who, who went through some stuff this year. And he gives a promising prophecy to a people who had really been cut down to nothing. And there was that old country preacher, many of you who grew up in church remember, that old country preacher that said, when you're down to nothing, God is up to something. When you're down to nothing, God is up to something. And I came to you this morning to just mention that whether you've had a banner year or have had a barren year, God is up to something in your life. And I believe the word is true that all things work together for the good. That no matter how you feel this morning, God is working for your good. If you're in a season of blessing or you're in a season of testing, God is working for your good. Now, Israel in the scripture, a powerful nation, a people of promise had really had been stripped down and left barren. But Isaiah, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, begins to hear a word from the Lord. And I, and I think that's powerful. I think it's powerful. I don't think there's anything greater than to hear a word from the Lord. When we come to church, when we get around the people of God, when we get into that prayer closet, when we get alone with God, we always have that eagerness, that desire to hear a word from the Lord. And how many know it's a word from God that will shift your season? So Isaiah hears a word from the Lord. And then he takes that word and he begins to deliver the message to God's people. And the essence is, in essence, is this. The message, in essence, is this. He's saying to God's people that new life will spring again. New life will spring again. In the midst of your captivity, in the midst of your bondage, in the midst of the enemy stripping you down to nothing, Isaiah speaks to God's people and says, new life will spring again. And that's the message this morning, that new life is on its way. There's a season shift coming to your life. God is getting ready to do a new thing. Come on, Victory Outreach. Somebody say amen. See, he makes this clear prophecy about a child, about a special child that's to come. When you read Isaiah chapter 11, I encourage you after the service to read the entire chapter. It speaks of a child that's going to be, a born, that's going to be born seven generations from that day. That in seven generations, there will be a child that will come through a virgin called Mary. And this child will not be an ordinary child. This child will not be like any other child that Mary is going to give birth to a king. And he's not going to be the king of a natural kingdom. He's going to be the king of a spiritual kingdom. And he's going to be a king that's going to shift the season of God's people. Come on, somebody. And how many know that king is Jesus? Is there anyone here this morning that you love Jesus, that you're serving Jesus, you're grateful for Jesus? See, this is what Christmas is all about. God in his wisdom sent his son as a child. And the way that God chose to come into the world shows us something about the nature in which he works within our life. The fact that Jesus came as a child. I love that song they sang, Mary, did you know 
Mary, did you really understand the power of this child that was born to you? And, 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 and the way that God chose to come into the world, because I mean, he could have came many ways. But the way he chose to come into the world speaks to the nature of how he works and also the work he desires to do in our life in a new season. How many know that he never leaves us without hope? And the God who came to shift our season, he came as a little baby. He came as a child. Now, I want to look at what a child represents. Think about these things for a moment. I want to look at what a child represents. And I also want you to think about the new season God's going to take you into. You ready for this? A, a, a baby, a child, number one, represents innocence. There's nothing more innocent in the earth than a little baby. You know, Matthew 18, verse 3, Jesus himself said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like what? Like children, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. And I think that's powerful. I think that. We need to continue to maintain a childlike faith. How many know God is looking for people with a childlike faith? Also, a child represents not only innocence, but secondly, joy and gentleness. Children bring joy to the family, and they bring a gentleness to the people in the family. When Jesus came as a child, it brought great joy. When you have a little baby at home or, or grandparents, you know what I'm talking about, you know? You could be going through all kinds of trouble, but when that baby shows up, there's joy that fills that home. And whenever there's a baby, there's joy and there's happiness. And, and then there's also a new gentleness, that, a, a new spirit of gentleness that comes over the family. A, a new spirit of carefulness that comes over the family. A new spirit of innocence that comes over the family. See, Jesus came to restore the joy and gentleness to our walk with him. Jesus came to restore the joy because sometimes as Christians, we lose our joy. We go through trials and situations and we lose our joy. That's the old season. But how many know in the new season, he wants to restore our joy. He wants to restore the joy of our salvation. He wants to restore our worship. Maybe this year there were seasons where you couldn't worship, seasons where you couldn't give God praise. But this is a new season. And in this Christmas season, he wants to bring your worship back. He wants to bring your praise. Come on and go ahead and just say, yes, God, I, I want to get my worship back. I want to get my joy back. He also brings back that spirit of gentleness because how many you know sometimes we, we become hard in this life? How many have ever met a hard Christian? A hard believer. They're just so hard. They're just hard. They're hard in the church. They're hard in the services. They're hard when you talk to them. Everything that comes out of their mouth is hard. But how many know the joy of our salvation returns a gentleness to our walk with God? What am I saying to you is that Jesus is saying we, our, our life doesn't have to be so intense all the time. We don't always have to walk so hard and so intense and with a heavy brow and a frown on our face. But when joy begins to hit you in a new and living way, come on, somebody. Come on and smile while you praise him right now. He wants to restore the joy of our salvation. So a child represents that innocence, represents that joy, and then also represents that acceptance and that openness. You know, it's difficult to reject a child. I don't think there's anything as an, any such thing as an ugly baby. <laughs> there's no such thing as an ugly baby. Come on, somebody. Every baby's cute. Oh, their squishy little cheeks and their fat hands and their fat feet. Come on, somebody. And you want to just bite them? Can I hear an amen? <laughs> I see these little babies. I'm like, I just want to bite this kid. <laughs> They're so darn cute. Can I hear an amen? amen? They're so cute. But, you know, Jesus, in, God in his wisdom came as a child. It might have been different if Jesus came as a full-grown man. You know, full-grown man ain't that cute. With their hairy beards and their straggly hairs. Can I hear an amen? But Jesus, God in his wisdom sent his son Jesus as a child. Because how many know the world is open to a child? The world is open to a baby. I, I think in, in this new season, God is saying, I not only want to restore your joy, I want to restore your openness. I want you to learn to be open again. I want you to have an open heart, an open mind. I want you to know that I'm a loving God. I'm a gentle God. I'm a, I'm a God with a promise. And then the fourth thing that a child represents is hope. Hope for a new season. 
hope for a new season. What, what does a child ultimately represent? A, a child that represents new life. New life. The prophet said to the people who were in bondage, he says, I, I, saw, I saw new life springing out of a dead stump. I, I saw new life springing out of, out, of a, out of a dead stump. There might be someone here this morning, you, you feel like 2018 was a year where you became a dead stump. You didn't bear any fruit. You had nothing but breakdown. You had nothing but problems. But what does the prophet say? I saw new life growing out of a dead stump. I seen a rose growing out of the concrete. Oh, man, I'm, I'm trying to get you excited this morning. I saw Rose growing out of the concrete. There's a new season on its way. There's hope. There's a new child. This is the season where the child is born. The baby Jesus is born. See, I want to tell you something. This Christmas, the bells will be ringing. You know that song. Every time it comes on, it says, the bells will be ringing. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. How many love that song? The bells will be ringing. And what am I saying to you, Vic Trowich, is that when those bells begin to ring, when those church bells begin to ring, when those Christmas bells begin to ring, it's a reminder that God's not done with you yet. It's a reminder that God's not done with you yet. No matter what season you have been in, no matter what battles you have been in, the bells will be ringing. The bells will be ringing. What is the history of church bells? I, I, I looked it up. I said, why does the church have bells? There's a purpose in the bells. There are actually three reasons church bells will ring. First, the bells were used to rally the people to the house of God. Woo. I mean, though, this Christmas, we ought to rally to the house of God. They didn't have Twitter. They didn't have Facebook. They had church bells. And when the people heard the church bells ringing, they knew it was time to get to the house of God and give him the praise that he is worthy of. The second purpose of church bells was to announce the union of a man or a woman in holy matrimony. So there was a purpose to rally the people to announce, hey, two people of God have come together to start a family. New season. Come on now. But then thirdly, the reason the church bells would ring would was to announce the birth of Jesus on Christmas Day. And, and all over the country and all over the world on Christmas Day, church bells will be ringing to let the world know that God is not dead. Ooh, that God is not dead. He's alive. Jesus is alive this Christmas. And guess what, church? When those church bells begin to ring, to ring it's a reminder that hope is still alive that the promises of God are still alive, that God has not forgotten you, that God has not left you to die on the roadside, but we serve a God that has a promise, that has a vision, that has a plan. And I say let this Christmas, let those church bells begin to ring. Let the people of Victory Outreach San Diego know that the best is yet to come, that the healing is on its way, that the miracle is on. I believe that this Christmas we can see miracles if we'll begin to walk in a childlike faith. I came to tell you, hope is not dead. Hope is still alive. And no matter what you faced, no matter what you're facing right now in this season, God is not done with us yet. Isaiah tells the people there is hope. But in order to see hope awaken, we must know the condition of men's hearts this morning. Now, I'm going to share these things. It may not be for people in this service, but I think it's a good thing to hear, especially when we do ministry, how many know we're going to minister to people this holiday season? Amen. How many, how many this, this morning say, you know, what, pastor, I know about five people that need to come to church. Yeah. I know about five people that need to rededicate their life to Jesus. Yeah. I, I know about three people that need to know that there's bells ringing at the house of God. Yeah. Who knows someone like that? Yeah. Then I want you to consider these points because there's three types of hearts in the world today. There are, there are hearts with no hope. There are hearts with false hope, and then there's those hearts with the true and living hope of God. I want to talk for a moment about those with no hope. You know, the Bible teaches that hope, hopelessness creates a sickness in someone's life. Maybe you know someone that they, they're always sick. They're always down. They're always struggling. They're always depressed. They're always kind of 
you know, under the weather. Talk to me now. Have you ever considered that they're without hope? See, no, no hope, I want you to know, is a poor perspective. To have no hope is the worst kind of perspective. And I've actually seen how some people die spiritually because they live their life based on the experiences of the past. I've seen Christians who get saved and, you know, get a touch of God. Or I've even seen, I've been there myself where, where you know, hope is lost because we, instead of looking at the future, we, we dwell on the past. Amen. Past experience says that nothing is genuine. That's what it says. The message of the past says nothing's real. Nothing's real. It says there's no genuine love. There's no genuine loyalty. There's no genuine help or care. And what hopelessness does is it carries a cynical spirit, a cynical spirit. There's a negative twist on every word that is spoken. There's a negative twist on the perspective of that person who's walking without hope. But the Bible teaches that the ho that hopelessness makes the heart sick. And I want to tell you, sometimes when we come into the house of God, we struggle with our past. We struggle with our past. Is there any honest people out there this morning? We struggle with our past. I've struggled with my past. Even during the holidays, it's sometimes a time of reflection. I, I remember growing up for us was tough. We grew up in an alcoholic, drug addicted home. I was raised by, you know, well intending parents, but really inexperienced parents. I ra was raised by parents who were not spiritual. They were not saved. And when I spoke at my father's funeral just a year or so ago, you know, when I spoke at his funeral, I didn't carry any bitterness in my heart towards him because I recognized that my father did the best he could with what he was trained to do. He did the best he could with what he was trained to do. And, and I look at that and I see he didn't have much. He didn't have much in, in, in terms of training. He didn't have much in terms of exampleship. Because he himself was abandoned at a very young age and he never knew his father. My mother became pregnant with me when she was 17 years old. 17 years old. And her father also died young in his 30s when she was 13. And in the 13 years she knew him, he was abusive and absent. So when I think about my upbringing, my parents themselves had no examples. And as, and as I begin to grow in, in the things of God and I begin to serve God, I begin to carry uh, hopelessness and bitterness within my life. Sometimes I would look at the preacher and get angry. Sometimes I would look at the preacher's family and get jealous. And instead of being happy, I would get negative. I would look at the church kids as brats, spoiled brats, walking into the house of the Lord, acting like they had it all together. Can I talk about this stuff? And when I and I would be and, and what I began to discover, it started to hinder my walk. It started to hinder my walk. It started to hinder. I wanted to do ministry, but I couldn't break through. And the reason I couldn't break through church is because I had unforgiveness in my life. And there was things that needed to be healed from my past. Mm, you ain't saying nothing to me. You ain't saying nothing to me. It took me many years. It took me many years in the house of God to overcome the pain of my family upbringing and the pain of my past. But let me tell you something. When God healed me and God shifted my season and God revealed it to me, I began to grow like I had never grown before. And I am the man I am here today because I let the Lord bring in the hope. I let the Lord bring in the healing. I let the Lord bring in the shift. That's the word for somebody this morning. 2019 is your year to shift into healing, into forgiveness into the next level. See, to restore hope, watch this, we have to die. To restore hope, we have to die to past experiences. We have to die to the experience that we had of yesterday. You might have been hurt. You might have been burned. Maybe you hurt somebody. Maybe you burned somebody. Maybe you did wrong to somebody. But I came to tell you, it is under the blood. The church bells are ringing. There's a new season on its way. He's going to restore hope. You've got to encounter hope once again in your life. Jesus looked at those men that he healed, and he told them this. He said, take up your bed and walk. 
And that's what I say to you this morning. Don't lay in that bed of no hope anymore. Don't lay in that bed of hurt anymore. Don't lay in that bed of say, I'm, I'm really praying for those that are sick in body, man. I believe that this is your season for supernatural healing. Come out of that bed. Come out of that past. Come out of that failure. Pick up your bed and begin to walk in the promises of God. Begin to walk in the breakthrough. Come on, somebody. So there's those with no hope. But the second type of person are those with, what, with, with hearts that are filled with something called false hope. False hope. And, and I, I begin to ask myself this question, what's worse? To have no hope or to have false hope? I, I begin to kind of realize that a, a man who finds himself with no hope is more inclined to accept true hope. A man with no water will drink the water you give him. But a man with bad water doesn't feel he needs water at all until he gets sick. Oh, come on, somebody. What's worse, to have no hope or to have false hope? See, false hope, in order to have a seasonship, must first admit that their hope was in vain. In order for someone with false hope to shift, they have to come to a place where they realize that their hope cannot stand the test of fire. What are some examples of having false hope today? Many people struggle with this. A, a drunkard who thinks he can quit any time has false hope. An addict who thinks he can escape his problems by getting high has false hope. Come on, talk to me, rehab. You know. Come on, if you know, come on, you know. A thief who thinks he can steal without consequence has false hope. Look at this. A rebellious child who disobeys his parents and thinks that they have gotten away with their action. That's false hope. A husband or a wife who's unfaithful yet thinks they're clever enough to get away with their actions has false hope. A person who puts their trust in material things will one day wake up to realize that materials and money will never bring you hope. Those who, watch this, hold on to your seat now. Those who have religion without relationship with Christ move in false hope. How many want to get closer to Jesus this year? In God's word, Eli's sons were evil. But they thought that they were because they were born into a prominent and godly family, they could get away with their actions. How many know they discovered otherwise? Wisdom that's not founded on the fear of God is vanity and vexation of spirit. Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse 18. And then those who are unequally yoked. Those who believe that if you marry an unbeliever, that you can lead that person to Christ, move in false hope. Most women who marry unsaved men wind up failing in their own Christian walk. This is heavy. And those who believe in a second chance beyond this present life, who believe that you can repent after you die, are going to discover something very horrible in their life. See, to be in false hope is to be in a spirit of self-sufficiency. Where dependency is not on God, but dependency is on self. What breaks my heart is to see how many people, you know, are so dependent on self. So dependent on their own talent and their own ability and their own mind and their belongings and their relationships in this world. There's such a spirit of self-sufficiency that wants to creep into the house of God. Where Christians no longer walk humbly, but they walk in pride. Oh, Lord, help us this way. We got to stop and talk about it, don't we? They don't walk humble anymore. They don't walk broken anymore. They walk in a cynical and a critical spirit of heart. 
Christmas can't be good and seasons can't be good because they're so self-sufficient. They don't see the Lord as their source. They see themselves as their source. They see their job as their source. They see their marriage as their source. They see their children as their source. But what happens when those sources are put to the fire? What happens when those sources are tested? See, see false hope seems self-sufficient until times of testing come. And when the times of testing come, the weakness of false hope is revealed. It's in those seasons of testing where you find out that drugs, come on somebody, are not the answer. And that alcohol is not the answer. And that being with every girl at your job is not the answer. And hanging out with these people is not the answer. And money is not the answer. How many know there's only one answer? And that's the child that was born. That was the root that came out of the stump. That was the rose that grew out of the concrete. That's Jesus this morning, church. Come on, somebody. That's Jesus. He's the only true hope. He's the only one that could fulfill every one of our lives. As Christians today, whether you've been serving God five years 10 years or five days we have to cultivate our relationship with Jesus we got to keep walking in the spirit and not in the flesh we got to seek him every morning we've got to read his word we've got to worship him in spirit and in truth whether the music's good or the music's not good we say I just love you Lord and you're my true hope you're my source of strength you're the one that kept me not only in the good times but you kept me in the tough times Someone say true hope. hope. And that's the third heart. True hope. How many know we have the true hope? We have it. And Peter challenges us to hold on to it. Look over at your neighbor this morning and tell him, hold on to the hope. First Peter chapter one, verse three says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus. Watch this who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and an inheritance that cannot be corrupted or defiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you and I. And what Peter is saying to us is that Though you might move away from the promise, the promise will not move away from you. And though you might move away from the Lord, the Lord is pursuing you with his love this Christmas. And the Lord is saying, I want to spend time with you. I want to give you your joy back. I want to give you your innocence back. I want to give you your prayer life back. I want to give you your finances back. I want to give you your healing back. But I, I, you got to want it this morning. You've got to be willing to recognize the things in your life that are false. Sometimes what we have really rob us from the things we truly want. I've learned that. We think we have what we need, but then it robs us from what we really want. And we, we need to walk in a true hope. I'm convinced of this, and I want to close with this. I'm convinced. Did you get something this morning? Yeah. I, I'm convinced, church, more than ever, that an on-fire, prayer-filled, conviction-driven walk with Jesus is the only hope we can have. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Really give him praise. If you agree with that, I want you to really thank him for that right now. Come on. Yes, God. Say it in your spirit. Yes, God. Say it in your spirit, yes, God. I'll say it again, and on fire, prayer-filled, conviction-driven, walk with Jesus is the only hope you and I have. It's the only hope that we can depend on, not only in the good times, but in the difficult times as well. And I came to tell you the bells are ringing, and the fire is coming back, and the power is coming back, and the prayer is coming back, and the anointing is coming back to your life. As they come, it's time to walk, not in hope, but to walk in a renewed hope. For those of you have, who have become dry this year, the bells are ringing. The angels are singing. Who's going to receive that anointing this morning? Woo, 
I feel it. I need it. The bells will be ringing. I love that song. Now you understand it. Now you know it. Watch this. Now you'll know why you feel the way you feel when those bells ring. It's the Spirit of God saying, I haven't, my promises are not asleep. My promises are alive. And those promises are for you. And if you stop praying for your family, let the promise of your family salvation be awakened. If you stop praying for your children, come on, you say, I, I must have lost them. I lost them to the world. I declare the enemy a liar. The bells are ringing. The promise for your children, salvation is still alive. You, you get up and you tell them, I want to invite you to church this Christmas because God has called you and God has chosen you. You have true hope. You have real hope. Could it be, oh, this is powerful. Could it be that your next season is, not, is going to look nothing like your last season? <laughs> Could it be that 2019 will look nothing like 2018? Could it be that regardless of your mistakes, regardless of your poor decisions, Regardless of your bad moves that put you in a storm, God says your life will bloom again. Israel, you're going to bloom again. Victory Outreach, you're going to bloom again. Personalize it. Oh, Pastor Al, you're going to bloom again. Sister Georgina, you're going to bloom again. My children, Avery, you're going to bloom again. Come on, your, your kids, your life, personalize it right now. Get in the spirit right now. I just feel the anointing. You're going to bloom again. You're, you're going to grow again. You're going to break through again. I feel the Lord. I feel the Lord. You can stand. You're going to bloom again. Your story is still being written. You just had a tough chapter. going to bloom again. And th this altar call is just for those. Just for those. And I say, Pastor, I needed that word. And I don't want you to be ashamed at all. Even if you haven't been serving the Lord, you say, I'm going to serve the Lord. I want you to get on up to this altar and, and say, God, I, I saw a rose growing out of the concrete. I, I see, seen a sheep.